Um, well, good morning or afternoon or evening to everyone. I know we've had people around the world register, so welcome to all of you. As Robin said, my name is Jackie Bennett. I am the Program Director for Africa and Asia at the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, or GFAS. And we have a lot to cover today. This will be our agenda. After some introductions, we'll go right into the presentations and then hopefully get some questions from uh, all of you that we'll be able to discuss and answer. So to start with introductions, I know some of you may not be as familiar with GFES, and so I'd like to take a moment to introduce us. GFES is a nonprofit organization that helps sanctuaries to help animals. And when we use the term sanctuary, we include not only facilities providing lifetime care to animals, but also rescue and rehabilitation facilities, such as those caring for primates until they can be returned to the wild. Our primary work is our accreditation program for sanctuaries, and currently there are over 200 GFS certified facilities located in 18 countries. These include wildlife centers, farmed animal sanctuaries, equine rescue centers, and some that are a combination of all of those. You can see who is GFES certified by visiting our website and going to the Find a Sanctuary page. For our accreditation program, we do have written standards that address many aspects of animal care and operations, including the issue of contact between humans and wildlife and how animals are portrayed in images. For example, our standards say that under certain conditions, sanctuaries can offer tours or other visitation to the public, but it should be done carefully to minimize the impact on animal welfare, and also it should ensure everyone's safety, both human and non-human. So for GFAS, a true sanctuary would not, for example, be offering activities to tourists such as petting lion cubs or taking selfies while in contact with wild animals. But our standards go beyond selfies as well, speaking to how sanctuaries should represent themselves, and specifically that the images they use should not suggest that wild animals are tractable, that is, not suggesting that wildlife make good pets. At the same time, we recognize sometimes there are other considerations to balance, as we know organizations that care for wild animals, such as sanctuaries, want to share the news of their work, in order to educate the public, they want to raise awareness, and also raise funds for the ongoing support of their missions. And so decisions need to be made regarding how to use images of wild animals, including baby animals, on websites, social media, and elsewhere. And so earlier this year, we were very interested when a new set of guidelines was published, the best practice guidelines for responsible images of non-human primates. Today, we're gonna to learn about these guidelines and take your questions as we all think about how they can be applied to our work. You will hear from the lead author of the guidelines and also from two sanctuary directors on two continents who will share their perspectives. Dr. Sean Waters has been working with wildlife for more than 30 years, specializing in primate conservation issues and with a research focus on human wildlife existence, particularly human-animal relations and people's perceptions of wildlife conservation. She is the founder and co-director of Barbary Macaque Welfare and Conservation, which is based in Morocco, and is also the initiator and co-vice chair of the IUCN Primate Specialist Group Section for Human-Primate Interactions, which published the guidelines we'll be discussing today. Noel Almrud is the Senior Director of the Cleveland Amory Black Beauty Ranch in Murchison, Texas, here in the U.S., which is home to nearly 800 animals, including primates, tigers, bears, and more. Noel also serves on the steering committee of the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, or NAPSA, and serves on the board of directors for the Oklahoma Primate Sanctuary here in the U.S., she has served as the chair of the steering committee for the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance since that organization's inception and was also recently asked to join the newly formed Bear Alliance. Dave Dutoy is the founder and co-director of the Vervet Monkey Foundation located in Zanin in the Limpopo province of South Africa. The organization was established in 1993 to address the need not only to care for these monkeys, 
but also to educate the public and change minds about a species that had largely been disregarded and viewed as vermin. Over the years, the Vervet Monkey Foundation has rehabilitated hundreds of vervet monkeys, including a large number of orphan baby monkeys. The Vervet Monkey Foundation is also a member of the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, or PASA. Uh, we have a lot to cover today, so I will now invite Dr. Waters to start the presentations. Okay, thank you, Jackie, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this webinar today. Um, so, as you've mentioned, I'm going to be talking about our best practice guidelines for responsive images of NHPs. Um, I'm going to abbreviate to BPGs because it's a bit of a mouthful otherwise. Um, here you see a number of my other hats, um, which uh, I'll be talking a bit more about, particularly the Barry Macaque issues, in, in a minute. Okay, so the best practice guidelines, BPGs, were published in January of this year. Um, they're approved by the Primate Specialist Group, the IUCN Primate Specialist Group, and they were um, written by members of the uh, Section for Human Primate Interactions, and we have a working group called Primates, A Changing Role of Primates in Human Culture. Um, these are the main authors, um, one of whom I think is attending the, Felicity is attending the um, webinar today. Both uh, myself and Felicity have a background of working in with captive primates in zoos, um, so we're not all um, just plain academics or we do have practical experience of working with primates as well as in the field, uh, in captivity as well as in the field. Okay, so um, why am I um, concerned, if you like, about how primates are portrayed on social media, um, especially when in close proximity with people. Um, basically, because you see some of these very sad photographs here, I work with a species that is um, used, exploited um, in the photo prop trade in Morocco, and also um, many infant macaques are captured every year and uh, either smuggled into Europe or kept as pets in Morocco and also in other countries. Um, it's it's quite a serious problem. About 200, we think, are smuggled into Europe annually. And we don't know what kind of situation we've got in Morocco. We often find, um, we often get called for about animals that have escaped from people's apartments. Um, animals are just released into forests in the hope that they will, you know, turn back into wild animals. Um, unfortunately, the photo prop trade... Um, is still legal in Marrakesh. Um, and um, as you can see um, in this bottom right hand corner, there are that's how the monkeys are kept when they're not actually working. So there are, of course, serious welfare issues as well as conservation issues um, with this uh, with this species. Um, so you know we've we've seen um, when, for example, um, Moroccan famous Moroccan people um, get their photographs taken with a barbary macaque, usually on a chain or something like you see in these photographs, the demand will actually go up because, because people don't really understand our work, always understand our work. We get inquiries about where they can, can they buy a barbary macaque from us? And there's always a sharp increase when somebody famous has had their photograph taken with a barbary macaque. Um, my other problem is that, you know, sometimes when I ask um tourists, um, both Moroccan and international, why they would want to have their photograph taken with an animal that is obviously not in, in the best situation. They say because, you know, we see other people do it. Um, people who work with, with monkeys, we see them do it. So why can't we? And it's a fair enough question, I think. So that's why um, I was quite keen to, to get, get these guidelines um, written. So um, why are they necessary? Well, in some research has shown that um, when people see photographs of a chimpanzee, for example, sitting next to somebody, they think that they're not threatened, they're not endangered. And they also, the most worrying thing about it is that they think that they might make good pets, um, uh, not realising that the, you know, the small animal that you see beside the human will grow into something very large and dangerous. Um, 
the the other problem are that that they these things can be misinterpreted across different cultures, and I'll be speaking about that a little more in more detail in a minute. Um, and so, the the whole the whole thing may make people want their own images close to primates, and I and I have spoken to people um, who have done just that. They've they've want to do what um, people what they see people like us doing. Um, they want to be close to a primate and they want a, a photograph to remember that. So it's not just about tourists, though. Um, we're all messengers uh, for uh, the species that we, we really care about. Um, and that includes researchers, conservationists, animal caretakers, tourist guides and government employees. So that's who these guidelines are for. They're not for the general public. So um, I think we have a huge responsibility, and I think we all know that, um, to consider what the consequences can be of publishing these images of ourselves close to a primate. And there are direct and indirect consequences. And I'm not talking about, you know, I've got, we've all got photographs where, you know, I've got photographs of where habituated barbary macaques have snuck up behind me um, and I've not realised. But I don't post those uh, photographs in public. Um, we've all got photographs of us in perhaps in, in close proximity to primates because of our work with them. But we don't necessarily, we shouldn't necessarily post those on social media. I think that's the, that's the whole point. It's not about not taking those photographs. It's, it's what you do, excuse me, what you do with them. So what I've got here on the, on the right-hand side is... Um, an excellent poster from um, the Jane Goodall Institute about how to stop, help stop the illegal wildlife trade. Um, because obviously some people would want chimpanzee in, as a pet and, and a lot of that trade is coming direct from, from the wild. And that's to be discouraged as much as possible, of course. So we've got um, on the left-hand side of the poster, we've got don't share posters, great apes kept as pets, wearing clothing, performing for entertainment, smiling or posing selfies. And then the last bit says interacting with people. And then in brackets, it says other than experts. Now, this is where I have a little bit of a problem with that. Because how does the public know who, who is an expert and who isn't? Um, it's, it's not easy always for us to tell, um, I don't think. So what we have to remember is that when posts are shared or they go viral, the context, which has been educational, raising awareness, um, it's about the conservation of the individual or the conservation of the species or the welfare of the individual, that context can often be totally lost and um, leaving posts to be interpreted as best the person who's looking at them can interpret them. Um, and who considers them, who is an expert? You know, people who exploit primates, people who, who train primates um, to do tricks in circuses, um, photo touts in, in Marrakesh, they may all consider themselves experts. Um, so who, how is an expert defined? Um, and then, of course, the other problem is, and that's a problem that I have uh, in Morocco, is that the photo is seen by those who don't read or speak the language that the text, the accompanying text is written in. And that means that those differences, um, which are to do with language, but are also cultural differences, um, may mean the photo is completely misinterpreted. So we all recognise this photograph I have here. Um, and, and I apologise for the fact it's rather an old example. But I was working almost full time in Morocco when it was when it, it went viral. And so I was able to ask Moroccans who don't... Uh, who, who speak Arabic, obviously, and Arabic is very different, written and spoken to um, Spanish, French or English. And so they, they couldn't read the accompanying text anyway. And I asked them to interpret it. And they're basically their simple interpretation was, this is a rich man taking his pet monkey for a ride in his plane. And without exception, you know, and these were, these were biology students, that's basically what they all said. Um, and when you look at that photograph in isolation, we all know the context because we work with primates. We understand um, the issues surrounding this photograph. This kind man is is helping out um, a, a primate sanctuary by transferring a, a, a chimpanzee that has been confiscated elsewhere. 
But how do we expect people in other countries uh, who don't speak French or, or English or Spanish to understand that? We have to think very carefully about how messages will be received in not just in the States or in Europe, in Europe, excuse me, but also in places like China, where there's a large demand for primates as pets. Um, the Middle East, where also there is a demand for um, endangered primates as pets, like gorillas, in fact. Um, so, and this is, you know, this is what can happen. This is a um, information from Andrea Dempsey who worked at the Zoological Society of London and um, some years ago uh, a white-faced oh, white-naked manga bee was born and a, a mother failed to rear um, the baby so the baby was handriad um, and there were videos put up on YouTube for educational purposes for raising awareness about the you know the, the species is very critically endangered in the wild etc and why it was so important that this this infant was um, was born and, and hand reared. Um, so you can see from the from the comments, um, cute. I want one too. Um, I want a baby monkey so bad. Um, where can I buy one? Now, obviously, not all of these uh, comments will translate into an actual purchase, but it kind of negates the the message when you have all these comments underneath the post. And obviously this wasn't the intended message at all. It really wasn't. And I think, you know, the people at ZSL were quite distraught by, by the comments that, were, that happened. The other thing that happened was um, a few, some years later, because the photograph, this photograph that you see in front of you is very cute. The, the wee hundred uh, infant is, is, having a chew on Andrea's nose. Um, this po photograph, Andrea found this photograph again, as you can see, um, being used to advertise monkeys for sale. Um, this is a very negative and very unintended consequence of these photographs being appropriated um, because they seem, they, they, we understand them and we, we see them from our own viewpoint as educational but others see them as a, obviously in this case, as a, an opportunity to sell um, monkeys. So I think we, we have to be very aware of, of what we post on social media um, when you look at what can happen. And unfortunately, you know, this, this photograph is out there in the ether and there's nothing that anyone can do. You know, Andrea can't get this guy. She's obviously been in touch with him and asked him to remove it. But, you know, why would he? It's a cute photo. Okay, so um, obviously, you know, I prefer to see barbed macaques um, looking relaxed and, and um, sitting in trees or foraging on the ground um, in, you know, whatever captive or captivity in, in reputable zoos and sanctuaries or in the wild. So um, that's what this photograph is there to kind of say. Um, so we have, when we were working on the guidelines, they took an awful long time to write because you know, we want we didn't want to make a very long um, academic tome, but we obviously needed to present the research that was available at the time to ensure that you know our, our guidelines were backed up. Um, so there are eight guidelines in total, and they are guidelines. There, you know, there's the guideline police aren't going to come and arrest people for not following them. I just want to make that clear. They're guidelines. The first one, which seems to be um, something that um, is is somewhat lacking in a lot of organisations, is a code of conduct about images of people and primates, and um, whether or not you know it's to do with whether or not you post on social media, what you do with those photographs. It should apply to everybody, and also the PR or communications teams, if they're not involved in writing this code of conduct, then they should be informed. And um, we've, um, I was very kindly invited to co-author a, a paper about um, the um, impact of the guidelines on zookeeping staff, primate keepers in, in uh, specifically. And um, I think the author, one of the main, the, the first author is actually um, taking part in the webinar today, Caroline. Um, and in this, in, in Caroline's work, she uh, surveyed 
quite a few uh, primate keepers and they are, or most of them, their organisations didn't have a code of conduct. And so they didn't have any guidance on what kind of photographs to post. So I think that is probably the first uh, and the most important guideline. If your staff and your volunteers and your students don't have any guidance on what they should, they, they, they can post or what they should post, then, you know, you can't really blame them if they if they post something that's possibly inappropriate. So um, if you're well known, which I'm not, um, then if you have images of you with primates in the public domain, um, then you can offer a different image to the the website or the um, the media, the newspaper article, um, if anyone reads newspapers anymore, um, and explain to them, you know, why your original image is problematic on some of these news websites, um, for example. And you can make a statement and put it on your own website to explain your position on primate images. Um, and I think that's important for people. Um, I know certainly that... Um, Jane Goodall and the Jane Goodall Institute, they don't um, issue photographs now and haven't for some years of, of Dr. Goodall in close proximity to a chimpanzee, although there are hundreds of photographs of her in close proximity to the chimp in the ether. Um, I think, you know, organisations should talk about the issues with primate images of, of uh, with, with people in close proximity to primates um, and think talk about them as well and discuss them with donors um, if you know if you need to do that I mean we've um, for Barbary macaque awareness and conservation you know if if we've been asked for a photograph of me or or one of my team um, cuddling up to a, a confiscated Barbary macaque we kind of explain why that that isn't such a great idea and it's never Luckily, you know, touch wood, up till now, it's it's never affected our funding. Um, so those of you who do have websites and do presentations and you do guided tours, then explain about why you, you don't um, support the photographs, inappropriate photographs of, of people and primates. So um, the next guidelines are four, five and six. So we recommend that there are no pictures of people inside primate enclosures, um, unless the context is very clear. I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, really better not to have pictures of primates in caretakers' arms because it makes primates um, look um, cuddly and sweet, which of course they, they are, but they don't always grow up to be cuddly and sweet. Um, but people will see that proximity as a sign that those animals would make a good pet. Um, and try not to have pictures of human primate contact without personal protective equipment, at, at least a mask, at least, um, if that's possible. So number seven, um, that's try to ensure there's seven metres or 23 feet between people and primates in any publicly shared image. Uh, that's not always possible, but certainly this is more for people like myself who, who work with primates in the wild um, because, um, you know, there are a lot of habituated groups of wild primates who will come very close to researchers and people. Um, so try not to publish photographs of you too close to a wild primate because, you know, there's an awful lot of problems with um, negative interactions with humans and, um, and primates in, in areas where for example, um, macaques in Asia are very habituated to people. And um, there's been problems as a result, not just with um, the macaques being fed poor diet, um, but also with attacks on people um, from because of their inappropriate behaviour towards the, the primates themselves. Um, okay, so I talk about context. I've talked about context an awful lot. Um, and that is the crux of the matter. And as I've said, you know, the context, um, if you explain the context, if you need to explain the context um, that goes with the photograph, uh, I think you've actually probably lost the battle already because you have to you have to think, would somebody would um, a 16 year old uh, in China understand this context without the text? Would um, 
a middle class um, man in Morocco with two children who are pestering him for a pet monkey, would he understand the context um, without the text? Um, so I think that's the, the kind of uh, that's how we have to prepare ourselves for the fact that things could go badly wrong with images that we that we publish. So I've put up two photographs here. Um, and I'd like to thank, I think one is from, the bottom one is from Colibus Conservation. And I'd like to thank them for um, publishing that on their, on their social media. For, for, because the context is extremely clear here. Um, and people are, are, are wearing um, PPE. Um, the, the animal is obviously being given veterinary attention. And then the one above is clearly in captivity. Um, and very clearly, these animals are not... Um, they are behind uh, a wire fence. It's not pretty, um, but um, its context is very clear. There's absolutely no um, chance that anybody would think that a chimpanzee would make a good pet from that photograph, I don't think. Although they look, you know, interested and they look intelligent, which is the main thing. So I think what we need to think about, and that's... Um, this is the main point, I think, is, is about the context and how we keep the context um, or, 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 you know, the photograph, the context of the photograph. Because our success in imparting information about primates, which we, we must do, um, it's part of our, our mission, is not, um, is not so much on our intentions as messengers, what we have to look from is that it's on the part of the me how the message is perceived, the person receiving the message and how they perceive the message. And I think basically that is um, the lesson that we all need to take, I think, from these guidelines. Social media is a huge benefit um, for being able to raise awareness um, and increasing knowledge about sharing knowledge about primates but it also is a huge negative um, because of the relatively ease where people can trade primates on the internet um, and you know the the fact that you know they can actually buy uh, primates on the internet I think we have to be very very wary that we could possibly be contributing to people's desire for a primate as a pet with the photographs that we publish so our reactions are, to the BPGs have been, um, they were quite, um, I was quite astonished by the media interest, I have to say. Um, and it was covered by the American Association of, of Science. And you can see the photograph they used there was um, of a, um, a primate keeper um, and um, looking like he's probably feeding um, apes from quite some distance away across a moat. Um, so a very appropriate image. But the writer of the article did say to me that they'd wanted um, a, a photograph of her in close proximity to one of her study species. And she actually asked them to read the guidelines before they before they asked her for another photograph. So um, and then um, we were also um, featured in The Guardian um, and there's um, Dr. Goodall holding a cuddly uh, furry toy chimp, um, which is good to see. Um, what was also interesting was um, the, the guidelines were downloaded, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times from our website. Um, but we also received a lot of messages from young primatologists, uh, people working with primates, um, carers, on how to persuade their organisations to develop some kind of code of practice about publishing photos on social media and elsewhere. We also had um, volunteers and employees from um, some rescue centres in various places um, in on, uh, in the world, asking how they could um, persuade their director um, to, to to change their policy because they were uncomfortable with the sort of photographs that were being uh, published on from their organisation. Um, NAPSA have recently adopted the BPGs as guides for best practice. Um, I. The ASA, European Association of Zoos and Aquarium, their primate tax and advisory groups for the great apes, 
The small apes, Afro-Eurasian monkeys and the larger neotropical monkeys have all fully supported the guidelines. And I've given presentations to both um, the great ape and the Afro-Eurasian monkey tags um, earlier this year. And um, I'm very pleased to see that the National Primate Societies of Central and South America are currently in the process of adopting the BPGs um, in general. Um, each um, primate society in, for example, um, Colombia, uh, Ecuador, Peru, they're all in the process of adopting these BPGs as a, as a whole. Um, and, you know, I sometimes think, why, why do we want to put people in a photograph with primates when primates are actually much prettier than we are um as you can see on the right hand side there um and so maybe they're just better off in a photograph on their own really um what i also found was there was a obviously a great need for these guidelines everywhere um because and because they're a relatively short document they've been translated so far by people who volunteered to translate them into 23 different languages and a lot of these languages are luckily in primate range countries now. So Indonesia, Madagascar, the Philippines, Tanzania, Vietnam. We've got Arabic coming soon. So those will be available to people in Morocco and Algeria and other parts in the Middle East. Um, and all these versions are available for download from our website. Um, as I say, it's not a very long document, which is presumably why um, people have been keen to translate it. Um, and hopefully read it, of course. So I'd like to thank uh, our supporters, Ohan Zoo Foundation, um, Pravind for his graphic, Christine for the infographics, and Andrea for her um, for allowing me to use her story about Conchita, the, the white name Mangabe. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Sean, that was great. And I'm sure we'll have some questions and more to discuss, but now I'm gonna turn it over to Noelle, our next presenter from Cleveland Amory Black Beauty Ranch. Hi, thank you guys so much uh, for having me. I'm happy to speak with you today. Um, again, my name is Noelle Omrid. I'm the director of the Cleveland Amory Black Beauty Ranch located in East Texas in the US. Um, to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, we, are, we were founded in 1979 by Cleveland Amory, who was an author and animal advocate. He founded the Fund for Animals, our parent organization in the 60s. And then in 2005, we merged with the Humane Society of the United States. Um, we're on about 1,400 acres, have about 800 animals and over 40 different species. And uh, we have the unique ability of having domestic and wildlife. And so we have to make sure that we're portraying these images in different ways. Obviously, when you're dealing with domestic species, um, farmed animals, horses, um, it's perfectly acceptable to show a picture of us cuddling with a pig. Um, and in fact, I think it actually helps the species because it shows that they're not necessarily needed for food and that they're sentient beings on their own. Um, up above that, I list sanctuary philosophy evolution. I think that's something that a lot of sanctuaries have dealt with over the past uh, 40 years. And the fact that maybe we didn't portray animals properly in the beginning, and now we are evolving. And so we're seeing that a lot in the sanctuary community, evolving to understand that uh, we do not need to show ourselves in these pictures with wildlife. Um, as far as our wild animal species, we have primates, uh, big cats, bears, exotic hoofstock, American bison, uh, reptiles, and most of these animals have been rescued from the exotic pet trade. So we definitely want to make sure that we are not portraying ourselves uh, interacting with these animals in a way that would promote the pet trade, since that's the reason why we took these guys in the first place. And so our ideals for our pasture or habitat space is to give them as much space as possible and to give them as much freedom from humans as possible. So our big cats and primate and bear habitats are multi acres. They're naturally wooded, um, natural substrates as much as possible. And so when we do photograph them, we are showing that natural environment. We're, not sh we're trying not to show them behind bars but we're not trying to show them interacting with people. 
And we, as a rule, have no interactions with wildlife, obviously veterinary issues aside. Um, exclusions would be for positive reinforcement training and those types of situations. But again, we're not readily sharing those photos with the public because it's not necessary. So uh, Black Beauty Ranch is affiliated with many sanctuary organizations. Um, we are members of the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, the Big Cat Alliance, and the Bear Alliance. And so these organizations were founded to bring reputable and legitimate sanctuaries together so that we could speak as a unified voice. It was also used as a way to advocate for these species so that if you have a number of reputable facilities all speaking about the same issue, it can be diluted. But when you have one organization that represents this number of species, then it suddenly becomes a stronger voice. Um, we're also helping other sanctuaries, members and non-members, to establish new policies and procedures, including policies that deal with public Im imagery of all wildlife as well. And then we're networking to help place other animals too, because many reputable sanctuaries cannot take in the, the vast number of animals that are coming to them. Most of these animals are coming from the pet trade. And I think that speaks on the fact that we need to speak up and say these images are not appropriate because it just magnifies our issues with running out of space. So just some guidelines on what NAPSA um, and the BCSA, our guidelines are for our members. Um, and I won't read this to you uh, verbatim, you can read it, but it, it mimics um, what Dr. Waters' policy is. And we were so thankful that, that, that she and this group came out with these policies because it's needed to be done for a long time. But all NAPSA members have to follow these procedures. And in fact, most of them already have their own policies like we do. Um, but it should, you know, we should show barriers between non-human primates and humans. Um, PPE is required. Now I will caveat that this picture was taken several years ago. So um, while we do use PPE, this was pre-COVID and now we do wear masks. So masks are required at our sanctuary. Um, and then this is a photo of Rebecca, our team lead on our primate team, doing positive reinforcement training with a chimpanzee. And so she's doing it safely. She's showing that there's a boundary, yet we're still showing the expansiveness of the habitat and the natural setting. Um, you know, obviously, as I spoke about the evolution of sanctuaries and how we message things, you know, historically, we probably weren't perfect in our pictures. And I'm sure that there would be some out there that might show something that may not, we may not consider appropriate now. And so part of our policy is to make sure that if anything like that does come up, we are clarifying, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't understand this relationship and how we could potentially negatively impact um, these animals in the wild and in the pet trade. And so you clarify when there's changes um, and when you've evolved. So uh, example for the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance, this is in our members regulations and all of our members must agree to not promote videos or photographs depicting these inappropriate situations between not only big cats, but that goes for any wildlife. Um, and so it's the same, same policy for, for both organizations. So in conclusion, I just wanted to point out that the sanctuaries themselves have responsibilities. And part of the responsibility is recognizing the influence we have when we share inappropriate pictures. Um, you know, we need to take that step and recognize that if we want to put ourselves out of business because we're not needed, because the pet trade has been shut down, then we need to speak up and talk about how these images are not appropriate. Um, we need to make sure that all reputable legitimate sanctuaries are adopting policies on how to appropriately interact with wildlife or display images of wildlife. And we need to recognize that we are part of the solution to end the betrayal of human and wildlife interactions. And so that's it for me. I thank you again for, for having me. Thank you so much, Noel. Um, it's a great presentation. And uh, we'll see if there's any questions from the attendees, but we're gonna move on to Dave's presentation with Rabbit Monkey Foundation. Hi there, I think you have read, I am, I'm uh, Dave Detroit from the Verbit Monkey Foundation. I'm the founder and uh, co-director. Um, we do uh, 
work with a lot of uh, volunteers and of course with a lot of um, orphaned or baby monkeys. So it is a very, very difficult thing. Um, we have had policies in place for quite a while, also thanks to PASA, the Pan-African Sanctuaries Alliance, which a lot of this stuff gets uh, discussed uh, because we all work with primates. Um, so we do make all of our volunteers sign a declaration that they won't actually publish um, any photos that have actually got people in them, or we started off with faces of people um, that anybody could see that they were handling monkeys. Um, this has become more difficult over time um, because monkeys are basically look cute. It doesn't matter how, how you portray them. I just don't know if my slides are going to work there. Um, even to feeding them um, and stuff like this, it always portrays like an image um, that this is something that somebody would actually like to do. Um, so, you know, we get a lot of this type of photos that we actually have to be careful of. Um, even if you don't have the person in it, yeah, you just got a hand or something like that. But of course, the face of the monkey and everything um, is the thing that's, that really becomes the problem. But you've got two sides to this whole story. You've got your marketing side and what you portray and what you're putting out there to the public um, and what is actually said and what is actually done. Unfortunately, um, it is coming across different culture lines, but I don't know, you know, it's very very hard to know where to draw the line on something. I've run a very successful YouTube channel at the moment, which has been helping us during this lockdown period. And uh, of course, there people are going to see us interacting with these primates. They're going to see us interacting with the uh, uh, smaller animals and things like this. And uh, what I found is there's a very, very small percentage of people that actually ask uh, or want an animal as a pet. And normally when you're getting this one comment out, if you've actually done enough promotional work, you're getting a lot of people within the group actually moaning at them and downing them and telling them why it's a bad thing and you shouldn't be talking like this and, and thinking about it. So I've found a far more positive um, reaction coming out of things as long as you get the right, right message across to people. But, of course, I wouldn't know what's going to happen if it's into a, a different language people can interpret it. Um, in different ways. And I think this is what, what sort of makes it very, very difficult. Um, but as I say, there's situations that you, you just have to be careful what you do and what your, what your captions are with each photograph that basically goes out to these people. Um, we've also got a difficult thing in our, in our area because people look at these animals as pests, as vermin, as things that attack people. So in some instances, you've also got to um, promote a positive light uh, of what is actually going on. So sorting your photos out is a very, very important thing and making sure that what you promote gives the right message. Like something like this, yeah, of course, is going. To, it makes you think, yes, this is a cute little guy, I want to have one, where something like this might be totally different. But, of course, the little face and the cuteness and everything is still appealing. Um, it's still, a, still basically a, um, problematic. So I don't really know where one actually draws the line in the end of the day. We need the material basically to, um, to help promote things in a certain, certain way. Um, we need to bring it across to people in a certain way. And we, um, we have to be careful what actually gets uh, broadcast across uh, social media. Uh, we sort of having another problem with the social media side is also these things going out on um, Instagram and people bringing up their own channels for their own following and deciding when does the photograph belong to the person who's taking the photo or when does the photo actually belong to the sanctuary. Um, so we're trying to bring in policies that anything taken on or at the foundation while you're volunteering here actually belongs to the foundation uh, so that we've got the right to tell you to withdraw it off any social media or anything that you've used and uh, that we can approve the photographs before you actually publish them, um, because this is also becoming a very, very uh, a major problem. But as I say, a lot of our work is involved with these little guys. Um, as orphans, it's hard to take the people out. You have to have uh, close contact with them. Uh, for any little baby under a certain age, it does need the contact. It's essential for its care. Um, so unfortunately, you are going to get these type of photos. Naturally, these aren't things that we push out um, on social media where we can help it. Uh, we try and keep the primates on their own. Um, 
basically like things where you've got uh, them either behind cages like this with your interaction. This is a little guy getting used to uh, the monkeys inside the enclosure before he's going to get released. Um, so you have to have people there caring for them. So, uh, yeah, you've got a feeding cage where the monkeys have all learned. So after a period of time, we teach the monkeys to drink milk on their own so that there's little interaction with volunteers or people. So your time spent with monkeys uh, is kept to a minimal and that they can get out to, um, to a natural environment as fast as possible where there's no longer human interaction. Um, and a lot of this type of stuff we try and explain to everybody along the line. So I think that is very important, your explanation, what you put below photographs, what you put out, what you let the public know, I think is very, very important. Uh, we do a lot of things showing the trauma that these animals go through as pets, the tough time we've got of taking them from a pet and reintroducing them back into the wild, what they go through, how they suffer. Um, and I think this also builds up a strong following uh, of other people that start telling people, no, this isn't a good idea. My new thing is also saying to people, you don't actually get a baby monkey. There is no such thing as a baby primate. Uh, because that only lasts for maybe six months, and then this little guy starts growing up and becomes a juvenile, and it's not a fun thing to keep anymore. So I think a lot more effort and work has to be going into um, basically not promoting baby monkeys or saying there's baby monkeys, but the problematic side of having these guys um, as pets. And if they, that's it from our side. Thank you so much, Dave. And, you know, again, I think that speaks to the balance. Sometimes you do want to portray your work and explain what you're doing, but doing it in a responsible way so that people are not taking the wrong message from it. Um, if anyone has questions, you can type it into the attendee chat. I had um, a couple and going back to Dr. Waters' presentation, Sean, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the research that was done and uh, kind of the the range of viewpoints that were gathered in order to put these guidelines together. Um, yeah, sure. Um, there was quite a lot of research done in the States actually um, on um, how people perceived um, pictures or photographs of, of people and um, chimpanzees and other species in close proximity. Um, I think, um, certainly with the publication of the guidelines, I think it's inspired an awful lot of other people to do um, more research on the topic. Because um, there are certainly going to be some photographs that um, do inspire people to think that they'd like a primate as a pet, and there are other photographs that don't. And I, you know, I totally agree with what Dave is saying about, um, certainly as we increased awareness about, you know, the, the plight of the Barbara macaque on social media, on Facebook, actually, and uh, I think every Moroccan has a Facebook page, um, when their friends published a photograph of themselves with a barbary macaque on their head in, in Marrakesh, an awful lot of people in the area where we worked in would pile in and say, um, as Dave said, that they would start criticising these people and say, what are you doing? You know, this is our... This is our natural natural heritage. These are a really, you know, important animal, and you're you're you know contributing to its um, demise. Um, so I think there, you know, there is it's a very very fine balance. Of course, um, you have, uh, and for example, you know, I don't have any problem with people who coexist with barn macaques in the forests where I work, because rural people regard is in in the animal as unclean because in in Islam primates are regarded as unclean um, and they think that city people are quite mad for keeping them as pets um, they think it's it's quite uh, the oddest thing so um, I think yeah the we do need more work I mean we certainly need more work um, and I think we need more work in different cultures to look at how photographs you know for example there's always this problem um, you know, when you see um, a white person holding um, a chimpanzee or an orangutan, how does that resonate with Africans um, who are thinking, you know, those those animals are getting better attention than my than my children, for example? Um, is there, you know, does that build resentment towards the species? Um, and I think th these are all things that we we need to look at. 
Um, it's a huge field of potential research, I think. Um, but at the same time, I think we, you know, we have to apply the precautionary principle, the research that's been done on people thinking that um, people uh, in close proximity to a chimpanzee in a photograph means that the chimpanzee isn't endangered and that it'll make a great pet. Um, I, I think, you know, that, that we can't ignore that research. Um, it, but there are um, restrictions on you know, the, the, the way it was done as far as the cultural impact of those photographs is concerned. So the research has been done mainly on um, people in the, in the, in the global north. Um, and of course, we know that we have a problem with uh, demand for primates as pets in other areas of the world. And their perception of photographs will be an awful lot different from ours. Yeah, that's great. We have a, I'm just noticing there are a couple of comments and questions coming in the chat and I'm trying to follow them. Um, and at this point, you know, for questions, any of the presenters want to, to weigh in, I welcome that. Um, we have one comment about a good point that I guess Dave had made about trying to have a policy that photos taken at your sanctuary can be regulated for use by the sanctuary or that they're owned by the sanctuary, that it's important but quite challenging to do. So I wonder, um, uh, Dave or, or Noel, if, if you can speak to that point and how you actually try to maintain control over images taken by your personnel and your volunteers. Um, well, I can speak about our policy. Um, we have a photo policy that basically says, um, as far as our interns and volunteers, they're not allowed to post anything on social media unless it's approved beforehand. And then we've done extensive training with our staff to explain what types of photos are okay. Obviously, we don't interact physically with our wildlife anyway, so there should never be a picture of one of our staff with a wild animal. But then we also make sure that they understand the context and that they can't po they can't take pictures of veterinary procedures because it can be construed. Uh, differently. Um, if it's through bars, they need to make sure that they are showing the habitat as well so that it's not just looking like an animal is in a small cage when in fact they have an acre behind them. Um, and then obviously it needs to be an appropriate subject. And so we go into training with our staff on what those subjects would be. Great. And we do have a comment from um, one of our audience members that it's not just applying guidelines, but also education, because it's related to modifying how people perceive primates. Um, and I guess that applies both to the general public and also to, to your own staff and volunteers, as you, as you just described, Noel. Absolutely. Um, I have a question, and I think it's a question we all ask, is there anything that can be done with the social networks themselves? Uh, report so many times, and they don't see anything wrong with the post. The, the posts uh, in question are not blocked or deleted. Um, I know Asia for Animals Coalition has just issued a report about uh, social media. And so there is a lot of, a lot of activity and a lot of, um, you're building a coalition to try to address this. But um, I guess I'll I pose that question to Sean. Uh, what can you suggest to us as a way to try to change the way social media is portraying or allowing animals to be portrayed yeah um, i mean i think it's um it's incredibly difficult i think the way forward is what the i mean i've not read the animals asia for asia report today it's about i think um perpetuating cruelty to animals um via social media and that is an enormous and horrendous problem um but um i i just think we're much better off forming coalitions um like animals asia ha have done and putting pressure on these um because as individuals they just seem, seem to you know quite capable of ignoring um you can report a post as, as often as you like and many people can report and they just say no it you know it it, it doesn't uh, it meets our standards um i think you know that we, we just have to be very careful about how how we portray our work um but I think certainly, um, co you know, coalitions are the way forward. I think we'll probably get further, you know, in in coalitions of NGOs um, uh, that, and groups, interested groups, than we will as individuals in in that uh, on that issue. But you know, just make sure that we don't add to the problem ourselves. I think is the main thing there. Great, thank you. 
And you had mentioned about the need to, to, to do more research, more research on different cultures. I see a question in the chat um, from a, one of our attendees. If we try to make this as research, can you help us or be collaborators? So what can you tell us about how we can contribute to further research on this and um, how perhaps um, others can work with you collaboratively to to extend these guidelines or, or apply them in different communities? Um, well, I mean, most of the research that's being done is being done um, via university departments. So it's um, usually uh, master students projects. Um, and, you know, hopefully, uh, a lot of that research will will get um, published. I mean, certainly uh, as um, the section for human private interactions, we don't we, we can act as a, a kind of um, conduit to, to help people um, get that research done. But I think again, it's probably up to you know um, the larger NGOs who can and probably best best be best placed to to you know give people access to these these sorts of, of, of um, situations where they can take take part in the research. I mean, most of this research is, you know, if you're using it via social media, you can do it by, um, you know, looking at, um, analyze it, you know, you can do discourse analysis, um, you know, publish one photograph on a page and see what people say about it or, or you know, um, and another photograph of, in a different context or a less clear context and see what, what, what comments come out. I mean, that's very simple kind of research that can be done, um, you know, desk based. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily going to mean, you know, enormous amounts of money in a travel budget or anything like that. So they, they are, these are good, um, some of these um, research questions that um, people have um, regarding how photographs are perceived, um, you know, in various different photographs in, in various different scenarios are perceived can be done you know via um just using your computer and social media um and i think that you know that's what we need to find out there are going to be you know photographs in in different kind of situations which are perceived positively and not um negatively and uh and I think that, you know, that's where we need to, what we need to look at. And, and those are going to be perceived positive and negative in different, in different uh, cultures. So, you know, if you're a, a Chinese speaker, for example, and you're at a university in, in the UK or in, in the States, you could just as easily um, access um, social media in, in uh, countries that uh, speak um, any of the languages like um, in China and, and look at the, Look at the perception, uh, the way that people are perceiving those photographs. Um, they're not. It's not going to be an immense kind of undertaking, but it's having the right, you know, the people who can who can do it. So I think university departments are probably the best place. You know, if you want to go there and and talk to your primatology department or or um, your uh, anthropology department, and I'm sure you'll find lots of people. Um, you know, lots of um, professors would be quite keen for research projects for their students, particularly, you know, when travel is still somewhat restricted due to COVID. Oh, that's great. That is a great suggestion. Thank you. And I see a chat going on in our attendee chat. Um, Charlotte Daniels helped with research for the Asia for Animals report that just came out, and she dropped a link into the chat. So um, anyone wants to access it and take a look, I browsed it very quickly this morning, but I'm definitely going to be reading that in more detail. We have another question. I guess will be our last question, that there are so many in the U.S., so many roadside zoos and pseudo sanctuaries. Is there a way to persuade them to follow similar guidelines? And that would be a very nice thing if they did. But um, I guess the question that I would throw out to all of our presenters is, you know, how do you change minds? Um, there are many sanctuaries trying to do better that are basically very good organizations that can always improve. But uh, we all know of the organizations that basically exploit animals for entertainment and how can you move them? And, and you know, can these guidelines be a way of, uh, of, of a step to persuade them to think a little differently? Um, in my opinion, I think as long as they're making money off of these human animal interactions and there's mm -hmm. very little chance of them adopting these policies 
So it needs to start with us educating the public so that they stop paying for these experiences. And as soon as they're not making money, they'll stop the interactions. Yeah. Um, Dave, did you want to just comment on that one? I always like to hear different perspectives in different parts of the world. And so you have a very different situation that you're, you're seeing in South Africa. I think these things are, are very, very difficult to control. Um, I do know a lot of the organizers, we don't actually work with any organizations that uh, promote petting of any animals of any kind. So as a sanctuary, we won't let them promote us if we find out that they're doing uh, the wrong, something that's not according to our, our ethics, uh, which is one way of doing it. But you know, the problem is you've got so many other little sanctuaries out there. And um, even in South Africa, we've got others promoting people to come stay in there for a weekend and play with the animals or pay so much to play with the baby monkey while they're rehabilitating it and this type of thing. And uh, so, of course, you'll get people um, going towards those sanctuaries rather and them ending up making the finances to carry on functioning Whereas you've got to be careful of what you're doing and it becomes detrimental to actually raising those finances for your sanctuary. Um, so there's a very, very fine line between what you should be doing or what you can do and cannot do. And um, I think one has to has to take this into, into consideration, consideration as well. I think it's very important to get the right message out um, more than anything. I don't I don't think you're going to ever stop um, everything that's going on there people are going to interpret things whether you like it or not and uh you know we've found some of our photographs also in the same kind of thing somebody took one of our photos and it was using it as uh to sell um, a different kind of monkey not even a vervet monkey for that matter uh, but they were using a baby vervet's photo uh, we did manage to get them get them to take it off um uh, eventually and remove the threatening that we're going to actually start suing them for using the photos and stuff like that um, but it's, it is a long process. We haven't had any success over social media uh, trying to stop it. I think if you just put something bad about COVID in there, uh, they might stop it then and get it banned and taken off. It might be a way to do it. But um, it's it's a very difficult thing to get to get these things prevented. And it's also a difficult thing to know where the, the, the line is of what you should and shouldn't be, be doing. Um, our aspect has always been to make sure we give a trying to give a positive approach to the work that we do and a negative approach to what's basically been happening because of people keeping these as pets and try and build up the following uh, that will stand for you so that when you're not there, they're also going to say things because Instagram, um, TikTok and all of these things have got their different followings. When we're having a look at who's following us on YouTube, we've got an age group of people from about 40 years of age onwards that basically watch the YouTube channel your Instagram channel, you've got your younger generation, so it's probably people in the age groups of in their late 20s upwards, uh, so they like a different, quicker type of content. TikTok is basically a silly program as far as I'm con concerned, and people just like stupidity. So uh, these are um, going out to the different types of age groups that are out there, and depending on what you publish, you get different followings. But, I mean, the thing is on Instagram, when we had trouble trouble trying to raise in funds, we had an injured animal. We got such a good response from Instagram because of the following that we had there. So, you know, it's, 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 I don't know whether there's ever going to be a solution um, of how to do it the best way without um, hindering the finances that can be raised with these type of things. Um, but you certainly have to be careful uh, of how you do it, what you put out there. Um, where it comes down to our volunteers, yes, we make them sign a document that um, they're not allowed to just use any photos or whatever the story is. Even under those circumstances, we still found them on, on social media. And then, and of course, I can't be friends with every volunteer that comes to the foundation, but we try to get others that have seen the photo to kindly ask them to remove it and just reinstall what the problems are and remind them that they have signed the declaration that they wouldn't do something like that. Thank you, Dave. Um... It's, I guess, uh, ongoing work for all of us to be responsible messenger, messengers and uh, explain 
why things are, are so important when we're talking both to our own internal staff and to the public. I know we're kind of at the end here. We've had a great chat going. Also, thank you to Shirley Ramirez who dropped in a link to the campaign in Costa Rica, the StopAnimalSelfies.org campaign, um, another piece of great work that you might want to take a look at. And um, thank you to all of our presenters today for your time and for your information. Um, we will we'll have this recorded. Uh, Robin, you can wrap it up. But if you have any questions about GFAS itself, you can visit our website or feel free to contact me, Jackie Bennett, Jackie at sanctuaryfederation.org. Thank you, Jackie. Again, I just want to echo what Jackie said. Thank you so much to the presenters. This has been a great presentation with such an important topic. And thank you, everybody, for attending and for all your great interactions. When I have the recording link set, I will go ahead and email everybody who attended and, and those that registered and weren't able to attend with the link to the recording, as well as I will include a copy of the chat because I know several different links were shared in the chat. Um, and in case you weren't able to get those down, I will go ahead and, and share a copy of the chat. If I don't get that out by the end of this week, it will be early next week. So again, thank you everybody to the presenters and to the attendees. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.